Father, thank you so much for your word. The fact that we can hear your word and respond, um, that really means a lot. It really says a lot about how much you value us, that you can speak and we can hear the voice of the living God and respond to what you say. So in this time, Lord, I know your people want to hear what you have to say, not what I have to say. So I just offer myself up as a vessel to be used to announce the good tidings of your great gospel, to announce the arrival of your kingdom and the opportunity to live within it. So come, send your Holy Spirit to help me in speaking and to help all of us in hearing and obeying so that we can bear witness to the truth of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this passage should be familiar to all of us. Because a few years ago, we all memorized it. You guys remember? Who, who memorized the passage? Okay. So three of us tried. That's good. That's good. Karen Burke actually did remember. Karen Burke recited from memory right before church began. Um, this is, and I know I've said this for a lot of different passages, but this is hands down my favorite passage in the whole Bible. Hands down. And it's not just because I'm preaching it today, uh, be, but I'm preaching it today because it's my favorite passage uh, in the Bible. And it is worthwhile memorizing it, but beyond memorizing it, this is a passage that is... Um, uh, the, the true treasures of it are unlocked when you live it. To memorize it is good. To live it is a whole lot better. So I thought that for my last sermon, I'd, I'd leave you with the final word of life in the kingdom of God by looking at these 17 verses from the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae and to the church at Friendship United Methodist Church. Um, I want to say I know the kids are here. Yesterday I heard my kids saying, I don't think they, they, they knew I was eavesdropping, but I heard them saying, we have to stay in church. I'd much rather go back to Sunday school. So <laughs> I understand. I get it. So for the kids in here, uh, I am going to be a little bit quicker than I usually am. So in about 30 minutes, uh, you, guys will be, you guys will be good to go. Uh, but I also wanted to say, you know, there, in my first church in Columbus, I can't remember the name of the church because I was only there for, for maybe six months. Hilltop United Methodist Church is what it was called. When I stood up to introduce my family, the pastor, uh, you know, we had uh, three small children at the time. And uh, at one point, uh, one of my youngest started making noise. And so as I'm introducing my family, I, I said then, all right, now it's time to be quiet. And so the pastor came up after me and he said, in this church, all children can make noise. And it was his way of really welcoming us and making us feel at home. So I'll say to you, if you're in here with children, your children don't have to shh or, or any of that stuff. They're, they're free to make noise and respond to what's going to be an amazing sermon, okay? <laughs> All right, so let's begin. I titled this sermon, A Guide to Practical Living. A Guide to Practical Living. What does it mean to be practical? Everyone wants to be practical, right? In fact, everyone thinks that they are indeed practical. But what does it really mean to be a practical person? Well, to be practical means that your, your thoughts and your ideas, uh, your hopes and your dreams flow easily into behaviors or actions that will bring those ideas into reality. So for example, if you, uh, if you wanted to be well rested for school in the morning, what is the practical thing that you would do the night before? You'd, you'd get some sleep, right? If you wanted to uh, get a really good score on a test, what would be some practical steps that you could take? You would study, right? Now, if you want to have a good life, a life of love, a life of power, a life of peace, joy, and prosperity, what's the practical thing to do? That's where it gets a little bit complicated a little bit complicated, right? Because we all know the easy practicality behind uh, getting a lot of rest in the morning. We all know that it's to go to sleep. We all know that to perform well on a test, you have to study. There's a lot of things that we use to get by in life where the practical solution is easy and it's obvious to everybody. 
But when it comes to the question of what does it mean to live well, everybody knows that the answers include uh, joy and peace and abundance and satisfaction and things like that. But how to have that life differs from religion to religion, whether you're irreligious or religious, the way to have that kind of life differs. And so the practical response that people give to those is always gonna be a little bit different. That's what the book of Colossians is about. There are false teachers going around trying to, tell, trying to teach people the way to have the good life. And it wasn't based on the reality of God. And so Paul comes to these Christians and he wants to tell them, here's how to have the good life. It's not by following what was known as the elemental spirits of the age. And if you've been here the last five weeks, you'll probably have a better understanding of what the elemental spirits of the age are. I won't mention that because if you weren't here the last five weeks, you'll be confused if I say even three words from, uh, from the last five sermon series. But what these teachers were doing, they were going around in a time where so many people believed in so many gods. And they were teaching people that if you want to have the good life, you have to live in harmony with these gods and with what they want. So the apostle Paul comes to them and he says, no, if you want to have the good life, you have to live differently. And the first thing that you have to do is set your mind on what is the ultimate reality. That ultimate reality is God. Now, a question I have is why is this the first aspect of attaining the good life? setting your mind on the ultimate reality. Because it doesn't seem like that would be most important. It seems like you would want to take an action step or something like that. Why does Paul say, so if you've been uh, raised with things, so if you're in Christ, set your mind on things above. Why is the first step towards attaining the good life setting your mind on what is ultimate? The answer is because what we hold as ultimate ultimately determines how we're going to be in the world. Your thoughts and your ideas about God are the most important thoughts and ideas that you have. If you think that God is mean and vindictive, it's going to impact the way you are in the world. If you think that God is out to judge you, it's going to impact the way you are in the world. If you think that God is a benevolent God that desires your well-being, it's going to impact how you are in the world. So Paul comes to these people and he says to them, if you've been raised with Christ, the benevolent God, the God who came into your world and died so that you can have life, if you've been raised with him, set your mind on things above. That's the first step towards having the good life. And that's the first step towards living a life that is practical. Because practicality depends on what we hold is ultimately real, right? And so Paul's like, if you want to live the good life, you need to begin by being raised with Christ and setting your mind on things above. So here's how this deals with practicality, and here's why I think um, this passage uh, ultimately teaches us how to live a practical life. Because what Paul is doing is he's presenting a world in which the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is good and benevolent and generous and kind, he's presenting a world where that God is the God we have to deal with. Now, if you live in that world, all of a sudden it changes everything for you. If you live in a world where God is good and God desires your good, where God is faithful, where God is, is, is compassionate, where God is merciful, all of a sudden your behaviors are impacted by the presence of that ultimate reality. So Paul comes to these Christians in Colossae and he says, set your mind on God. Let your mind rest on who God is, how God manages the universe, how God desires for you to be in the universe. And if you would set your mind on things above, all of a sudden you're living in a universe where you can ask the question, since Jesus Christ is alive and Jesus Christ is for me and with me, how does that change how I could live my life today? Just think about that for one second. You go, for the seven years I've been here, I, I would like to think that um, I've, I've at least endeavored to teach about the availability of the kingdom of God and the reality that you can live your life right now knowing that God is with you. 
not just as a detached theory, but as a real presence where God is speaking to you and acting with you and loving you and guiding you. So what Paul is saying and the question that he's inviting us all to ask is, if that's true, we should go about saying, since Jesus Christ is alive and since he's the ultimate reality that I have to deal with, and since he's good and he's for me and he desires my good, how's that going to impact the decisions I make today? That's where practical living comes from. It's the knowledge of an ever-present benevolent God that desires my good. It changes the way that we could act in the world. At least I hope you see how it changes the ways that you could act uh, in the world. The first thing it does is, is it helps us realize that we no longer have to use these self-preservation strategies uh, that the godless use to make our way through the world, right? We no longer have to, to do those things. What are those strategies? Well, these are strategies that people use when they live in a world that's devoid from God, from a God that's personal and good and kind. The Apostle Paul states it this way. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. What are all those things? Those are all good things that people use in the world to make themselves feel good, to secure their own goodness and their own well-being and their own place in the world. So they'll use things in an evil way because it secures their own existence. And Paul's like, if you've been raised with Christ, you can set those things aside. You no longer have to be greedy. Why does he say that greed is idolatry? Have you ever thought about that? Why is, why is greed idolatry? We typically don't look at greedy people and say, look at those godless pagans, you know? Look at those idol worshipers. Worshiping money. Worshiping money, yeah, but you can be greedy for a lot of stuff. Greed is idolatry because when you're greedy, you're putting your trust in having a lot of the thing that you desire. And you're essentially saying, by having these things, I'm securing my own future and my own identity. And if you do that in a world where God exists, what you're saying is my trust is in the thing I'm greedy for and not in God. So he says greed is idolatry. Is idolatry. So the Apostle Paul's saying, if you've been raised with Christ, you can set aside greed. You can set aside lust. You can set aside lying. You can set aside uh, evil desires. He's inviting us to shed ourselves of the practices that the world uses to get by and to just be done with them completely. I remember Dallas Willard once asked, and you guys knew I was going to mention his name once today, but he was teaching his students, and he asked them, if someone had a pill that you could take, and upon taking this pill, you would no longer be able to lie. How many of you would take the pill? That's a hard one, right? Why is that hard? Because we know how to use lies to our advantage. We know how to live by lies and by deceit. And so the idea of never lying again, that actually doesn't seem like a blessing to us. It seems like a curse, you know? Suppose you go home later today and someone says, hey, how'd you like the meal that I cooked you? You know, we understand the value of or how we can use lies to our benefit. But the Apostle Paul is saying, if you live in a world with a benevolent God that desires your good, you no longer have to lie anymore. You no longer have to be greedy for gain. You no longer have to use fornication as a way to experience pleasure that's detached from commitment. You no longer have to do those things. I remember the first time and to talk about the opposite of greed, which is idolatry. You know, we grew up in a household, my parents are both ministers, and I remember distinctly one time uh, where I, I experienced, um, you know, kids always want to have a lot, you know? And I, I remember one time we were at a church in Toledo, and it was me, my brother, and my dad, and we were going out into the neighborhood to invite people to a church event that was taking place. Well, before we left, this guy in the church, he came up to my dad. He said, hey, Pastor Tim, the Lord uh, laid it on my heart to give you this money. And he hands my dad a $100 bill. So, you know, to me and my brother, we are rich. You know what I mean? 
we just, we see the $100 bill, we've never seen a $100 bill before, and we're just amazed, like, oh my goodness, we have just made it, you know, we're gonna hit up the stores later on. Long story short, as we're going into the community, a man is on the street asking people for money. My dad takes a $100 bill and gives it to him. Later on, me and my brother's like, why did you, <laughs> you know, why did you give our future to this homeless man, <laughs> you know? And he said, God gave it to me so that I can give it to him. The opposite, the opposite. He taught me through that action that my future and my life isn't wrapped up in the material possessions that I have but it's wrapped up in God who supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that's the kind of life that Paul's inviting his, his fellow Christians into. Not a life where you use the things of the world to secure your life, but a life where because you know that your life is so secure in God, it frees you to give of yourself to other people. I love the language that he uses. It's the language of someone that's changing clothes, right? The, the things that we, that, that we mentioned uh, that we aren't supposed to do, he says that we should put them to death or take them off because we belong to Christ. So he says, take them off the same way you would take off a shirt that's been stained and ruined. He says, take them off and throw it away. You no longer need those things anymore. You see what this does to practicality? It completely eliminates the thought that you have to get by in this world using things like sin and wickedness to your advantage. I think this is a big deal for our day because many of us struggle learning how to live as people of God in the world. I remember at my last church, there's a guy who, um, he worked on Wall Street, and as I was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and some of the qualities of Christ that were invited to uh, to exhibit in our day-to-day -day activities. He said to me, you know what, that works for church and that works for maybe school and stuff like that, but on Wall Street, you gotta be cutthroat or you're just not gonna make it. You see the, the idea system that he's imbibed? In some jobs in the world, he's saying, you can't use goodness as a means to get by. You have to be wicked. But what the Apostle Paul is saying, if you've been raised with Christ, you can set all wickedness, all evilness aside and embrace the good life. He goes on to talk about what you can put on. You know, if you take off all these evil things, you're not just gonna stand around naked, right? So he goes, he goes on to say, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with or put on compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These, according to Paul, are the practical ways of getting by in the world with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. These should be the characteristics of God's people everywhere. These reveal to the world whose we are. And I'll tell you guys, this is what the community wants us to really be. They won't say it. If you ask the community, and you know, our district superintendents always ask us if we're going to ask the neighbors what they want from the church. They don't have the answers. They don't have the vocabulary to express what they want from the church. What they think they want from the church is for us to be a nice community center, for us to be a safe space for their kids to come to VBS. And those are all good things. But what the people of the world really need and want from the church it's to see people who are living well, to see lives of goodness and power and love and generosity. They want to see that because that's what they want for themselves, but they don't know how to get there. And so the world needs us to be these people who live with such a forceful idea of the reality of God before our mind that it frees us to be who God created us to be. Compassion, kindness, meekness, humility, gentleness, patience. Let me spend some time on this last word real quick of patience that the Apostle Paul mentions, because this is one area in which I don't think the translators got it right, but there is one translator I found that really honed into what the Greek meaning of this word patience is. 
David Bentley Hart, he's an Eastern Orthodox priest, he translates it this way. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on inward compassion, honesty, humility, gentleness, and magnanimity. Magnanimity. Instead of patience, Paul says, be magnanimous towards one another. Be magnanimous towards one another. You know what magnanimity means? It's a Latin word that means greatness of soul. What would it look like for you to have a great soul towards one another? To be magnanimous towards one another. What does it look like to be magnanimous? Magnanimity doesn't mean that you're doing things that you don't typically do, but magnanimity changes the things that you normally do. The things that you do normally are now done with greatness of soul. So let me give a few examples of what magnanimity uh, looks like. My daughter Trinity, you know, she, she does recitals. Uh, she goes to Miss Dina's Beyond the Bar Dance School and they do, um, uh, they do the Nutcracker every year. And you know, I go and I, to be honest, when I'm going, I'm like, you know, I've seen it before or whatever, but when I get there, I always have a really great time. The last time I went, you know, I like to people watch. That's probably the skill that God has gifted me with the most. I watch people, you know. Some people call it stalking, but it's not really stalking. It's just, <laughs> it's just watching people. It's observing people. And what I noticed is during their performance, I noticed that they don't do anything just kind of simply, you know. So in their, in their play, if you wanted to, to tap someone on their shoulder, what we would do is just something like this and say, hey, man, you know, we just tap. But in their performance, they do something like this, you know, <laughs> you know? And then the person whose shoulder's tapped on, what we would do, we just look to see who's tapping. But in their performance, they'll do, you know, something like that. It's, <laughs> what is that? It's magnanimity, right? They're doing a normal thing, but they're doing it with greatness of soul. And I said to myself, that's how Christians are supposed to be in the world. Not necessarily, you know, fl with great flourishes, but the things that we do, we do them with greatness of soul. Which is why, let me give a few examples of what this looks like. One from the Bible and three from real life. Remember when Jesus rebuked his disciples because the, the children came to him and uh, they were like, hey, send these kids away this is Jesus of Nazareth here, man. You know, he has a billion followers on Instagram. Get your kids out of here. Jesus is busy. Jesus rebuked the disciples, and then it says that he took each child and he blessed each one. It didn't say he blessed all of them. If I wanted to bless all of you, I could do it in five seconds. It says he blessed each. Magnanimity. The thing that he did, he did it with greatness of soul. The other day in the office, you know, one of the things that Sharon does every week is she creates the blast that most of us receive via email, but there's a few people in our church that don't do email. So she will, uh, she will print the blast off and mail it to them. But I noticed that instead of just printing it off, she was taking time to edit it down. And I asked her what she's doing because to me it seemed like she was wasting time, you know? So I said, what she's doing, she said, I'm removing the, the spots that say, click here. Because you can't click something on a physical piece of paper. Magnanimity. We had a staff luncheon the other day at Carrie's house. I'm always impressed when I get there because it's not just like, you know, the food has been prepared and whatever, but the place has been prepared to receive each and every one of us. There's table decorations, magnanimity. By the way, Carrie and them have uh, steak on every Thursday <laughs> evening. So if you guys, if you guys want to show up Thursday evening, what time is it at your house, Carrie? <laughs> at six. Thursday evenings at six. Magnanimity. That's how God wants us to be in the world. That's the legacy. That's the reputation. That's what the world wants to see. They want to see what it looks like for people who truly believe in God to be in the world. Not doing things that are abnormal, 
but the things, the normal things that we do, doing them with greatness of soul. That's why Paul finishes, whatever you do in word or deed, do them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do includes a whole lot of stuff, doesn't it? So it includes how I go to work. It includes how I go to school. It includes how I am at home. It includes how I am when I'm playing, how I am on vacation, at Kroger, when I'm running. That's what the world needs. Friendship United Methodist Church, that is what the world wants us to be. Because they want that for themselves, but they don't know how to be that. They don't know how to have the abundant life that Christ promises. So they look, they're looking out in the world to see who has this life. In an era where spirituality is on the rise, I mean, there's so many spiritualities and so many people who are promising that if you do this thing or you do that thing, you're going to experience goodness. But they've done this thing and they've done that thing and they didn't experience any goodness. So they're looking out and their, their ears are tuned up and their eyes are wide open because they're searching for the abundant life. Eternity has been implanted within each and every one of us, and people really want to lay hold of it. So Paul goes to the people of Colossians in a world where everyone else is still looking, and he says to them, people of God, if you've been raised with Christ, set your minds on things above. Take off the evil way of being in the world and put on the godly way of being in the world. Be magnanimous in the normal things that you do. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what happens when you do everything in Jesus' name? What happens is, and this is something my, my dad used to say, our natural gets combined with God's super, and it turns it into something supernatural. Our natural gets combined with God's super and it turns it into something supernatural. You know, we're gonna, we just got a house uh, in Wyoming. Shout out to, where is, okay, all right. Don't, don't take this away from my sermon time, but where's Meredith Gorenz? Meredith? Yeah, Meredith, can you stand up real quick? Stand up, Meredith, come on, man. If you need a realtor in Wyoming, please look for Meredith. Uh, Garen, she will really take care of you. Look, the first, you can sit down now. Thank you, Meredith. The, the first house we looked at, um, you know, realtors have a way of saying everything uh, in a very positive way, right? So the first house we looked at, uh, it was as is, you know, so it was kind of junky in my opinion. Meredith is like, oh man, this place has a lot of potential. It's like, what, what are you looking at? But she doesn't she does really, she does a really great job. So thank you for that. As we're going to be in Wyoming, obviously our relationship with friendship is going to change. Um, but we're going to hear things about friendship, you know? The things I want to hear, you know, it's, it's going to be great, like, oh, friendship renovated the church, friendship did this, friendship did that, friendship got new carpet, friend, you know? Those things are good. But you know, the things that are going to make me really praise God are the stories of how magnanimous the people of God at Friendship are being with one another and in the community. With the stories of how much love you guys are holding one another in. The stories of the gentleness and the humility, the meekness, the patience. Those are the stories that reflect the presence of God in the community and amongst the people of God. So if you've been raised with Christ, set your mind on Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And as you do those things, you'll realize opportunities to change the normal things that you're doing into magnanimous things done in the name of God, trusting that as you do your natural, Christ will add his super, and this community will be filled with the supernatural presence of God through each and every one of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your children here. Thank you for the love that you have for us, the peace, the patience, the kindness, 
the fruits of the spirits that are flowing through us. Help each and every one of us, God, to imbibe those characteristics, to be strengthened by them and to give ourselves to them so that we can reflect your glory and your power in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.